Good afternoon. It's good to be here. So I have a big charge here tying this all together. I want to talk to you today about social identity and social interaction. And I want you to get inside of yourself for a few minutes here and think about yourself each morning when you come out of your house and you're heading off to work or heading to school or to a job or just playing with friends. And I want you to think about what it's like, who you are, and how you interact with other people. And the reason why I want you to think about that is frequently in society, we don't think about that. We don't think about who we are and how we interact with each other. However, here in the United States, where we're very diverse, it's important for us to pay attention to that. It's important to us to understand who we are as individuals, what our social identity is, and what happens when we interact with people who might be different from us. That's really important for us to understand. I teach a class here at the university called Experiencing Difference, and it is a fun class. Well, I think it's a fun class, um, but I have my students interact with each other. And as we learn about difference and what that means to interact with people who might be the same as us, the first exercise that we do in class or the first assignment has to do with social identity. Who am I? How do I sh show up in interactive spaces? How I am in the public world? What do I bring that I learned from my family, from my community growing up? And what does that mean when I interact in a diverse world? One of the things I was thinking about, I think of diversity and people coming together all over the world, I think about airports. I just got back from a trip. And an airport's a very public space with a lot of diverse people in it, coming and going, different things, different ideas, things that they have to do. But there's a certain thing that we all learn about or know about when we're traveling, and that has to do with boarding the airplane. There are certain rules that you have when you're getting on the plane. And a lot of it has to do with the baggage or the luggage you're bringing on. And there are rules. The rules are you carry on baggage. It has to fit neatly above the above compartment and or below securely in the seat in front of you. But we've all seen that person who's coming on the plane with four or five bags and pushing things and cramming things in the top and really not paying attention to the other people around him or her. Their world's important. Their perspective is important. Where they're going is important. And their bags are important. But they really are not paying, to other, paying attention to other people. How we show up in spaces with other people is really important. And we need to understand how we bridge the gaps when we might be in a diverse situation or in a diverse environment. So when I see, we've heard the word diversity quite a bit today, and I like to throw the question out there and make sure we're all not on the same page, but we kind of have a general idea of what diversity is. So when I say or you hear the word diversity, what does that mean to you? You can shout it out. What does diversity mean? A variety of people. Okay, what else? Promoting inclusivity, that's a great one. What else? You've heard a lot of it. To, oh, was some, I didn't want to cut somebody off. You've heard a lot about, yes. Race and differences? Embracing. embracing differences. Yes, embracing differences. So those three answers that we got are those that you might be keeping to yourself. They're all correct. Diversity has a lot to do with differences inclusively, embracing things. That's really, really important. And when we look at diversity, we need to understand what it means in the spaces that we're in. One of the neat things about being here in the United States is that we're a very diverse country. We are diverse culturally, racially, ethnically, socioeconomic class, lots of different things that make our country special. And a matter of fact, the United States is one of the most diverse countries in the world. And often that diversity is celebrated and excited and people love it. But there's other times when people don't like diversity. If somebody looks different from them, if somebody sounds different from them, if they talk different, don't celebrate religion in a certain way, that bothers some people. So sometimes diversity is something that's disparaged. And one of the things we really need to understand about diversity is that the meaning that we assign to diversity is significant. That meaning, our understanding of diversity is significant. The meaning that we assign to diversity has a lot to do with our perception about the world and how we see others. 
Do I include somebody or do I exclude somebody in my space? Do I embrace that difference or do I push it away? And very often when we're thinking about that diversity, it has a lot to do with that inclusive circle that we have. And it has a lot to do with when we're in social spaces, how we interact with different people. It has a lot to do with our opinions of others and our opinions of ourselves. One thing I want to, you to take away from today, and this is a quote, it's not mine, but it comes from a book from a, a group of um, writers who talk about diversity in a multicultural world and with respect to social justice. And I want to read a quote from Adams who says in the book, diversity and the appreciation of differences is connected to social justice and the unequal ways that power and privilege construct difference in our society. That is a very powerful statement. Because here in the United States, power has a lot to do with who gets to control things. We know there's a lot of unequal things in society. We know there's not equity. That's some things that we're striving for. All the speakers that came before me talked about that. Is there equity? Is there going to be equality for people? Are we able to embrace those differences? And very often, when we look at differences, we tend to judge other people. We have preconceptions of people before we really even know who they are. The images that we learn, the things that we're taught from a very young age, we tend to think about others in a way that meaning we give, it's a closed vision. It's kind of tunnel vision. We don't get the total picture. So when we're looking at somebody and trying to figure out who they are and understanding where they come from, we tend to have a skewed perception of that person. And we make judgments about that person's sensitivity, that person's intellectual abilities, that person's kindness, what they're able to do in society, could they be a leader, who they are. We have a tunnel vision, we don't have the total picture. So before we meet people, we have this preconceived notions. We judge them. They're different from me. I don't like that. That's not such a good thing. And we tend to push people away. And our, with that obscure vision, it really makes us more closed-minded. And that makes us, when we're having those social interactions, instead of collectively being together and learning from another, very often we're bumping heads. We're going against each other. There's this kind of friction. Those judgments that we make about others, we tend to push them outside of our circle. Social identity theory talks about a we versus them. And so very often when we're looking at our social identity, we're trying to find how people fit together with us. I'm comfortable if somebody's like me. Or if they're not like me, I'm not so comfortable with that. And it makes many of us uncomfortable based on that meaning that we associate with difference. That's so important. I have this picture that I use very often when I do diversity uh, workshops. And I want you to take a good look at that and pay attention because it's so important. And the quote on that says, if you do not see yourself, you cannot understand your impact on others. So in the class that I teach and also my diversity workshops, I talk about before we can start experiencing difference and understanding other people, we really have to look inside of ourselves. Who are we? What is it that we bring to that social interaction? Am I bringing negative thoughts about other people? Do I not like that person because they don't practice the same religion as me? Or they talk different? Or they dress funny? That shows up with us. Sometimes it's not just the words we say, it's our nonverbal behavior. Sometimes when you enter a room, just by the way you look and the way you're presenting yourself, nonverbal behavior, other people pick that up and they can see that you may not be embracing, you may not be inclusive in your actions when you're in a diverse situation. Here in the United States, and the speaker before me talked about this so well, about how we put people in different categories. The United States loves to do that. We group people and we put them in different places. But once you start categorizing people, you're othering and you're pushing them out. And here in the United States, I'm, I'm using our country as the central part because things are different in different places. Um, but when you think about here in the United States, we have what's called social identity statuses. And there's about seven or eight categories that we group people into that let us know they're different or they're other than us. And those seven categories are gender, race, ethnicity, age, ability, social economic class, sexual orientation, and religion. Those seven or eight categories, very often we put somebody in, in a space and we say, you're other, you're different from me. And those identity statuses, statuses tend to be dominant or subordinate in the United States. And when I'm saying dominant and subordinate, I'm not talking about power, I'm not talking about numbers, I'm talking about power. People that have dominant identity statuses tend to be the ones who are in control of things in society. When the early English settlers came here to the United States, they set up a system about who was gonna be in charge. 
And if you look at these identity statuses, those people with dominant identity statuses were in control of things, and they controlled other people. Those identity statuses are here with us today, and they impact how we're able to go around society, how we're able to be accepted in society, and sometimes how we're not accepted. Each person, we have these different identity statuses, but we also have master statuses um, that go along with these identity statuses. Um, and our master statuses tend to dominate all the other statuses of our identity. And what I mean by they, they tend to dominate, those are the statuses when you walk out of your house, when you, you're going out in the morning or you're interacting with people, your master statuses tend to dominate the other statuses in your life. And depending on what they are, they make it easier for you to navigate communities, schools, neighborhoods, jobs. Um, and everyone's master statuses are different. I will use myself as an example to maybe have you understand that situation a little bit. I have, I, like everyone else, I have seven or eight statuses. But the statuses that I feel um, impact me the most daily, I, the four of my statuses I would consider, four of my identity statuses I would consider master statuses. And that is my race, my ethnicity, my gender, and my social economic class for where I live. Um, for my race, I'm part of the um, African diaspora, so my race is black. My ethnicity is African American. My gender is female. And my social economic class is middle class. I would say middle class here in Fairfax County. Um, what does it have to do with anything? My master statuses, three of my master statuses, would be considered subordinate in this hierarchy of what's stronger, or, or not strong, what's above or what's below, what's dominant and what's subordinate. Although my statuses of being female is considered subordinate in the United States, my status of being part of the black race is considered subordinate in the United States. My ethnicity of African American is seen subordinate in the United States. And my middle class status is pretty much, I would say, dominant. But subordinate statuses don't make me feel subordinate. I just know when I walk in my house and I interact with other people, people in society judge who you are. And your status is where we categorize people and put them in different ways and we other them and push them out. And I know that with my social identity statuses, I don't have a lot of power to control certain things in society. And so these identity statuses often set up the way rules are run and the way things are done in the United States. I want to explain two things just for a little bit, because very often when we look at our identity statuses, people interchange race and ethnicity back and forth, and they're not the same things. They're different. Um, there's a phenomenal uh, documentary that was made back in, I think, in the early 2000s. It was called Race, the Power of Illusion. And they talk about how race is um, a social political construct here in the United States. People are categorized and put together in one group based on phenotypes, what they look like on the outside. It could be your hair texture, your, the shape of your eyes, uh, the melanin in your skin. And that tells us about the external parts of a person. It tells us very little bit about the internal part. Okay, it doesn't give us much information. Also, the scientists talk about there's really no biological um, basis for the difference of race categories. And in fact, if you look on the genetic level, genetic research has shown that there is more common within group differences than there is between differences. And that's something to understand with race. It's used socially and politically to, for one group, that group that's in power, to control other groups that do not have the power. Ethnicity is a little bit different. That is really tells you more about a person. It gives you the rich, deep understanding of who a person is. That person might be connected to other people through language, through cultural practices like rites of marriage, the birth of a child, traditional dress, as we saw earlier, traditional dance, art, different things that bring people together, food and music. And that will tell you more about a person. And when people came here to the United States, all the different groups that, that came here and migrated to the United States, very often they would go to cities or places where other people who shared their ethnicity were together. They could share a common language. The food was the same and they felt safe. And so a, a, a person's ethnicity will tell you more about themselves, about them than their race might tell you. So why does this matter? Why is any of this important? Why do I need to know, or why do you need to know about a person's social identity status, how they interact when they come in social interactions? Why does this matter? It's so important because the meaning that is assigned to diversity, or the meaning that's assigned to difference, has a lot to do with how you show up in those public spaces. Do you have a social identity that allows you to feel that I have more privilege than somebody else because I was born this or that? 
Do I have more advantages in society because I'm upper middle class and I have a lot of money and I don't have to think about things daily on the economic level? Do I have more advantages because I was born white in this society and not born a person of color? Do I have more advantages because I'm a male and not a female? Those different uh, social uh, identity status has a lot to do with power and has a lot to do with control. And we really need to understand ourselves and how we show up in these social interactions. And do our identity contingencies help a social situation or does it hinder a social situation? You want to look at yourself and ask yourself, do my social identity statuses allow me to be loving and open in a community, allow me to embrace that diversity, allow me to include people in my space, allow me to sometimes just sit back and listen and learn from somebody who's different from me. Just because you're someone who has dominant statuses does not mean you know everything. It's very important to learn and respect and understand the diversity of this country because that's what makes us who we are. And right now we're fighting each other, butting heads, we're not paying attention because that diversity for many people is a bad thing. We don't like it. We don't like anything that's different. And we need to learn about that. If we want to move the things further in life and kind of bridge those gaps that everyone talked about today, we have to open our hearts and listen to other people and learn from other people and learn about other worldviews. There's more than just one way of doing things. So going back to the airplane situation I talked about earlier and thinking about it, it's busy, people are rushing. If you're like me, I'm a very nervous flyer, so I'm kind of very attentive to what's happening. I pay a lot of attention to other people. But sometimes in your situation, do that self-check. Am I paying attention to other people? Is there someone else who might be nervous? Is there someone I can help? Is there somewhere that I, is there something in this situation that I can offer somebody else? Can I learn from somebody else? Because we really need to open our hearts and listen, like I said earlier, to other people and really learn and embrace the diversity of this country. It is what makes us who we are. And by understanding differences, by respecting that and in being more inclusive instead of inclusive, it allow us to bridge the differences that we see in the United States and really grow as a nation. Thank you very much. Thank you.